the title was announced before, but I'll announce it again. Uh, it's Christians Under Pressure, The Weight of the Current Conditions in the Middle East. As we are reminded daily by the media, extremism and civil unrest throughout the Middle East has placed the lives of ordinary people in extraordinary danger. Arab Christians and other religious minorities are indigenous to the Middle East and are essential elements of the region's cultural, religious, historical, and national fabric. Without this indigenous present there, the Middle East and the future will be terribly impoverished. We have a very distinguished panel this morning to help us to more fully grasp the difficulties facing Christians and other minorities in the Middle East and ways that we can help to alleviate the weight of their duress through support of and participation in different initiatives. Each of them will present their perspective, after which we will open the discussion up to the audience for questions. Our first speaker is Ambassador David Mack. From 1998 until 2008, Ambassador Mack was Vice President and Acting President of the Middle East Institute, a Washington-based educational organization. He currently continues as a scholar at that institute. He is also an elder at the National Presbyterian Church. For over 30 years, Ambassador Mack served in various positions in the U.S. Foreign Service, including serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. In that capacity, he directed an the conduct of relations between the United States and 12 other governments, including Iran and Iraq, the states of the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant, and diplomatic assignments in Iraq, Jerusalem, Jordan, Lebanon, Libya, Saudi Arabia, and Tunisia. We are very fortunate to have Ambassador Mack with us this morning to open this vital panel discussion. Please welcome Ambassador David Mack. Can people hear me from this microphone? Good. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit in awe because I am both the least educated member of this panel I always say that I didn't have enough patience to stay at my university and get a PhD, so I married a PhD instead. <laughs> but I'm also by far the least credentialed in religious terms. So I'm going to approach my task with a great deal of humility. And being a good Presbyterian, I hope, I will start off with a confession of sins on the part of the noble work that I think was otherwise done by U.S. Protestant missionaries who went in fairly substantial numbers uh, to Middle East countries during the 19th century. Their achievements in the fields of education and medical care were really um, stand as a great tribute. And one of the reasons why not having a colonial past in that area, the United States was very a very welcome entry into the Middle East initially um, after um, World, World Wars I and II, we didn't bear the same kind of onus as France, England, Russia, um, others 
Italy, certainly others who had had um, a colonial existence there. Our presence had been that of those American educators and medical missionaries who established Roberts College in Indonesia or in, in Istanbul, um, uh, American University in Beirut, American University in Cairo, um, hospitals all the way down the Gulf from Basra to Oman, um, areas with no uh, or very little in the way of indigenous Christian populations. So the United States enters with a great deal of goodwill. Um, I might say that in general, as I think about the long history of the region, um, what was the biggest mistake that the American missionaries made when they went into the area? I would submit that their biggest mistake was to treat in a fairly contemptuous manner sometimes the indigenous Christian communities. Basically, the approach that a lot of, my mission, of our missionary forebears took was that these people really don't know how to pray right. Um, they hadn't been reformed. They needed a good dose of the Reformation. Well, since I grew up in a community where we had, this was Sam's Valley, Oregon, where we had no minorities at all except for a few Catholic families, I can tell you that for us, the only people we had to discriminate against were the Catholics, which we regularly did at least in conversation because they drank wine and otherwise were not up to our moral standards. So it doesn't surprise me when I read in the letters of one of the early Protestant missionaries in Mosul, Iraq, a place that is now a subject of considerable interest in the news, a place that had a Presbyterian church as early as 1834. Think about that, 1834. There was no Presbyterian church in California in 1834, but there was a Presbyterian church in Mosul. An American went out there in the latter part of the 19th century to take over the mission. And he reports back in his letters that he had a very warm welcome from the Ottoman uh, provincial authorities uh, in Nineveh, Mosul, but that he encountered a lot of hostility from the Chaldeans and Syriac Christians who couldn't understand why this American was coming in and with the objective, as they saw it, of stealing their sheep from their flocks. And I think it is true that with all of the wonderful examples of educational and medical work by Protestant missionaries, sometimes uh, we went a little overboard um, on the theology side. Uh, not always recognizing, as the last panel, I think um, it was eloquently put out, uh, uh, suggested, that it was the example of Christ's practice, not the theological precepts that he was laying out um, that might have had the most powerful impact and should be um, our guidance. If I think about um, the history of our own country, pluralism is the factor that has created our society as a very dynamic one. 
with all of its flaws, the U.S. model today has huge strengths that the Puritan Massachusetts Bay Colony did not. Now think about the Massachusetts Colony, where my wife's ancestors came from. It was thoroughly purged of Baptists, Quakers, Catholics, and in due course, intact Native Indian societies. And it had some fantastic accomplishments for a short period of time in history, as was also true of Imperial Japan and Prussia, two other societies that were basically um, purified uh, in ethnic terms, but because of their political stability and cohesive population managed to mobilize some incredible energies. But in the end, those kind of experiments often turn out in a bad way. In the Middle East, we might think of some examples like post-conquest Judea, led to the kingdoms of David and Solomon. The magnificence that came out of that. Um, we might also think of the Nejdi heartland of today's Arabia, from whence sprang the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, you can think, if you think a little bit about the history of the region of other times, when there was a purified society dominated by one particular sect. Um, I think of uh, Carthage. Uh, none of us want to do without the wonderful theological achievements uh, that come from St. Augustine and uh, the Byzantine um, uh, periods that followed in Carthage. But when all of that was swept away in the Arab conquest, nothing remained of an indigenous Christian population until, and I would submit this was an, a real effort that failed miserably, the French came in, established a colony in the late 19th century, proceeded to put a cathedral up on the top of the Birsa where every Muslim in Tunisia could see it and declared that the glory days of Christian Carthage had returned. Well, what's the result? Today, so far as I know, the indigenous Christian population of Tunisia, one of the more or least, least um, unsuccessful examples of Arab nation building, in all of Tunisia, I failed to find one Tunisian indigenous Christian. There are, of course, European minorities and so on, um, but as far as a Tunisian Christian church, it doesn't exist. So it's where Christian communities have managed to integrate into the larger society. That's where they have not only made huge contributions to the vitality and dynamism, particularly on the economic and educational and cultural side of those societies, but they have also survived. That had a lot to do, I think, with the particular um, structure that was set up by the Ottoman Empire, one in which they tolerated um, a high degree of independence by non-Sunni, uh, non-Turkish um, communities, provided they paid their taxes, provided they didn't present any political threat. And as a result, we saw 
some flourishing by Christian communities in countries like Lebanon, like Syria, like Iraq. Certainly when I arrived in Iraq, um, somewhat before the Saddam Hussein regime came to power, the Christian community was incredibly important, particularly in the educational, commercial, and medical fields. It did not presume to try to engage in Iraqi politics, wisely so. And as a result, it survived throughout the period of one of the most dreadful and despotic authoritarian regimes, that of Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party. They went after the Kurdish minority. They went after um, the religious leaders in the Shia um, Arab majority, but they basically collaborated and protected the Iraqi Christians. In Syria, we have another highly authoritarian regime, and we have Christian communities which were well integrated into the society and managed to make very important contributions. Now, I'm not saying that a secular dictatorship um, is the ideal. If, you know, if secular nationalist regimes um, were the ideal form, we wouldn't have had the horrors of Europe during the 20th century. Two ghastly world wars in which the level of destruction far exceeded anything taking place in the Middle East today. The rise of Soviet communism, Nazism, the Holocaust, all of those things cannot be attributed, uh, I would submit, uh, to religious creeds. Um, that's a part of human experience uh, for which um, neither Christians nor Jews nor Muslims um, uh, can um, uh, have to feel responsible for, at least in my view. So today, we face a situation where in both Iraq and Syria, the countries have dissolved into a turmoil that quite frankly has little to do with us. We didn't cause it, although we took certain actions, particularly in the, in the way we overthrew the government of Saddam Hussein and proceeded to briefly colonize the country and try to turn it into a Middle East version of Norway. We took certain actions that gravely accelerated the process toward the turmoil we saw today. But what's going on, I believe, is basically a conflict within Islam uh, and I'm sure that uh, Imam Yahya al-Hindi will be able to us en enlighten us more about that than I possibly could. Um, but our contribution, I think, has to often be one of cautioning um, the indigenous Christians in particular to stay out of politics. To be honest, I wonder and I fear for the Christian community in Egypt, the largest today in the Middle East, that is so closely associated in the minds of Egyptians with the current Egyptian government that I fear it could become a scapegoat um, at some point in the future. Um, with those brief remarks. I'd like, to, I, I'd like to just say that the, um, the Christian communities in Iraq and Syria, to my experience, were able to exercise a considerable degree of religious freedom as long as they stayed out of politics, did not present a threat, and contributed 
to the economic and cultural vitality of those countries. Thank you. I'm going to get this this way. Thought provoking, wasn't it? Um, our second speaker, His Excellency Robert J. Carlson, Archbishop of St. Louis. Uh, the Archbishop is also on the advisory board of HCEF. Archbishop Carlson was installed as Archbishop of St. Louis on June 10th, 2009, and serves on many committees and advisory boards. He received a number of distinguished awards, including the Interfaith Partnership Award in September 2011, the Service to the Community Award from the Ecumenical Leadership Council in May 2012, and the Order of St. Louis King Award in November 2015. Archbishop Carlson's experience and passion for vocations, youth ministry, and priestly formation will give us a unique perspective for this panel discussion. Please welcome Archbishop Robert J. Carlson. Thank you. I'm sure like uh, myself, many of you have witnessed the current refugee crisis by watching CNN and Fox and the other stations that each evening would show us hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing from Syria for sure, Iraq. Uh, I still cannot get out of my mind the picture that was in the newspapers of the young child that washed up on the shore in Turkey. So the first thing we know whenever we talk about refugees is that there's tremendous pain and suffering. I've now been a priest for 46 years, and so uh, at different stages in my uh, ministry, I've been asked to work with refugees. Um, the fall of Saigon, I worked with uh, people who were escaping uh, from Vietnam and also uh, people who were from the Hmong community, which the CIA had convinced to help us rescue downed pilots, the Vietnamese not liking the Hmong. Uh, but when they came to uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, where I was, all I knew is that they were both Catholics. And so, uh, in a very immature worldview, I got them all together and I said, now you'll work together, won't you? And they all said, yes, Father, we will. And a month later, I'd come together and they still would not have done anything. And so I said, no, uh, you'll work together, won't you? Yes, of course we will. Well, to make a long story short, they never did. And so I met with them uh, in different groups and they said, uh, no, we don't plan to work with each other, we don't like them. So the first thing I'd like to say is, when we're working with refugees, even if they're all Christian, we cannot assume that coming from different places, that the bond of Christianity which holds them together is gonna to allow them to also work with people from another country. Secondly, I'd have to say that my experience with the current refugee crisis, uh, both in Syria and Iraq, uh, came home to me in a very powerful way uh, last year when I was visiting the Holy Land. And we happened to be up in Amman, and I met a pastor from the Patriarchate whose uh, parish was very close to the Syrian border and whose resources, uh, whose people were overwhelmed by the uh, refugees from many different religions, uh, including Christian, and various Christians who were uh, crossing the border that he was trying to assist. Uh, he seemed to be a very holy and good priest, but he was one who was exhausted and overwhelmed by the issues. In addition to that, uh, I was talking to uh, the head of the Pontifical Society in the Holy Land, and I said, what's the biggest issue? He said, well, don't assume that all Christians want to come to the United States. He said, as a matter of fact, most of them would like to stay uh, in the countries that they came from and in the areas uh, uh, which they know. And I said, so how can I assist? He said, we're going broke feeding them 
and anything you could do to assist us would be most helpful. And then uh, I met another group of Christians and I said, well, how are you assisting? They said, well, we're uh, building homes for those who have fled, who for one reason or another cannot return. And so I discovered that perhaps the best way that our little diocese could assist was by sending uh, food so that people could be fed and also sending money so that simple homes could be built and that we could actually do our part to help Christians uh, stay um, in uh, the countries that they came from, which I don't think is unlike uh, the work of the uh, foundation as we assist uh, Christians, uh, Palestinians, uh, and allow them to also uh, build fruitful lives because doesn't every father and mother, every wife and husband desire that for their own family? So I would like to offer a, a slight suggestion, a small suggestion. Uh, as Rahib said this morning, there are some 20 works of the foundation. And as we know from the wonderful uh, uh, brochures and other things that are present from the uh, foundation, uh, that these works are most important for Palestine and successful. But because um, most of us live here in the United States, and while we might go to the Holy Land often, uh, we don't know what's happening on the ground day to day. And I would like to suggest that perhaps there's a role for the foundation to be in contact with those who are members and beyond to suggest ways that we can work together uh, to keep Christians in the Holy Land to allow those people who don't desire to immigrate to the United States, although sometimes if you listen to the current political candidates, it seems that everybody wants to come. Uh, the fact is, I'm told many Christians don't want to come. Uh, and the foundation could perhaps uh, help us know the ways that we can uh, use our resources uh, to assist the Christian community on the ground today, those who have fled from Syria uh, and from Iraq, and as we know also, uh, when a refugee comes, uh, it doesn't, they don't bring their religious credentials with them. They just bring a rich faith tradition. So it really doesn't make any difference who we help uh, as long as we're helping uh, work towards peace in, in the Holy Land and in those countries that are suffering so greatly right now. So I think there's an opportunity here for the foundation that I think we could prayerfully consider. And finally, uh, I come from the diocese in which there is the town Ferguson. You may have heard about it. Uh, and while it's been out of the news for a couple of years, uh, things move on, uh, we still are on the ground, and we've developed a program which might be helpful too as we address this issue. It's called Pathways to Progress, where our Catholic uh, Charities staff continues to work with them, helping those people move out of poverty through education, through financial resources, through work, and through uh, stable communities with uh, decent homes. It strikes me as I listen to all the work presented on behalf of the foundation in these last two days that uh, this is truly the work of the foundation, providing pathways to progress to strengthen those who desire to remain in their homeland no matter what their faith tradition. Thank you. Our final speaker is Imam Yahya Hendi, the Muslim chaplain at Georgetown University. Imam Hendi is a public policy and conflict resolution fellow at the Center for Dispute Resolution at the University of Maryland School of Law and the Maryland Judiciary's Mediation and Conflict Resolution Office. His many achievements include being the founder and president of Clergy Beyond Borders. Imam Hendi often visits and lectures at churches and synagogues, hoping to create a new positive relationship between the followers of the three Abrahamic religions. He has given interfaith and general lectures in the United States Asia, Africa, Europe, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, Australia, and the Middle East. It is a blessing to have Imam Hindi as our final presenter for this panel on 
Christians under pressure in the Middle East. Please welcome Imran Hendi. I come from a Palestinian background, a Palestinian who is dreaming of freedom, and I thought it would be good for this morning to liberate myself from a chair. <laughs> uh, so I thought, let me stand up and free the spirit and see where I will go with this. Uh, my sisters and my brothers, our friends, uh, in the foundation of the foundation and those who support the foundation. It's my honor to have been asked to speak before you on a subject that is, uh, for me, very close to heart. Uh, it's not an issue of academia. It's not an issue of, uh, it's not very far away from me. It's very close to me. It's very much at heart. It's in my DNA believe it or not. When I, I see the topic, uh, Christians under pressure, my immediate response was, we Muslims are under the pressure too. We're under the pressure for three reasons. Number one, because our Christian sisters and brothers are under pressure, and that puts us under pressure. After all, the Christians of the Holy Land are our neighbors. I am from the city of Nablus. My father taught back in the 50s in Bethlehem. Um, I grew up reading the Bible like reading the Quran in a small Palestinian Muslim village. Uh, and therefore, when I hear of Christians being under pressure, for me, I am under pressure because those are not those, they are the family members of our Palestinian family. And I grew up being taught those values by my father, the school teacher, and my mother who catered for the needs of 11 kids. Go and wonder. I don't know how she did it. We complain about two or three kids in a household in America. I don't know how she did it. God bless her heart and soul. So this is why I believe I am under pressure, because my Christian sisters and brothers are under pressure. But number two, because Islam is hijacked. And that puts me under the pressure. It is in the name of my beautiful faith and religion has this happened, not completely, but some of it has happened and is using my religion, my faith, my scripture, to, to undermine the Christian presence in, 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 in the entire region. So that puts me under the pressure too. But number three, I am under the pressure because the entire region is under pressure. The whole climate in the political, the social, the financial, within Palestine, within the, the Middle East, and in America here, also puts us under the pressure. I don't know so often whether our American neighbors know what is really going on in the region. I often find myself the advocate, not only an advocate, but the advocate for the Christians of the Middle East, my brothers and, and, and my sisters. Uh, I don't know where to go with this. It's a huge topic, that one. And by the way, never give a microphone to a clergy. <laughs> we love to talk, you know? So I don't know, you made the mistake, Dorothy, and, and uh, Ratib, you made the mistake. You gave me the microphone. Uh, so my friends, uh, I will recommend the specific things uh, in a few minutes that I think we need to think about. But I want to, number one, say, maybe responding to somehow what David said earlier about um, who is to blame or not to blame or about the Shia Sunni thing. Having studied the Ba'ath Party and having looked into a lot of their literature and history, I don't know if uh, Saddam Hussein uh, favored the Sunni Iraqi 
is of, uh, of his own country. The Sunnis also were undermined by the Ba'ath party. The Sunnis were also undermined by Hafiz al-Assad. Uh, I think the Ba'ath party is what the Ba'ath party is or was. It is a group and against freedom, against democracy, against the human rights. Within the Ba'ath party, there were people from a Sunni background, a Shia background, and a Christian background. And all thought of religion as the enemy of, 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 of the region. And, and therefore, I really think it's quite important to think of this because, and related to this, I was one of the clergymen and women who met with the President Bush before the war in Iraq. Of course, obviously, for that meeting, he was not interested in our opinion. He wanted our signature. And thank God, none of the clergymen and women, Jewish, Christians, and Muslims who were present in that room signed on his war. All of us, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Orthodox Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims, I was the only Muslim, we said, absolutely not. He was under the impression also that this, that the Ba'ath party was a Sunni party against the Shias and the Christians. So obviously even the man in power had little understanding of the region and the history of this. But I also remember in one of my points, I also remember in one of my points telling the president of the United States of America, I said, Mr. President, number one victims of the war in Iraq will be the Christians of Iraq. And I said, I am telling you, as someone from the Middle East, as an American, as a humanist, as a lover of my Christian sisters and brothers and a promoter of their rights in the Middle East, please think it twice before you do that work. I said the, the church will be undermined when you create a chaos and you, when you create instability. And I told him, I remember my words, I said some of the people who are advocating for this war are saying we are going to, to Christianize the barbaric Muslims. If you remember, Frank Graham said that he had $10 million ready to turn Muslims from the evil religion of Islam to the peaceful religion of Christianity. And he said, with that, we will support our troops. But that is what made the news in the Middle East. That's what made the news, that American Christians are here to Christianize Muslims. And therefore, it is a crusade. I'm not saying it was a crusade. But remember, we work with TV images, we work with social media images, and often images are more powerful than realities. Often I find myself as an imam in the Middle East having to say all of this stuff in defense of my Christian American friends. That no, 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 this is not the Catholic Church of America. This is not the Protestant Church of America. I know Christianity. But those are the images that were used to recruit anti-Christian movements in the Middle East. I have been there, I have had discussions with people who have used the specific images of Frank and Graham or what, someone who wants to burn the Quran or things of that sort, or the president when he used the word the crusade, we are going to wage a crusade against them. I remember I picked up the phone and I called the White House and said, please tell the president, stop using the word the crusade. I know what he means, but that's not what it means in the Middle East. You need to think of the socio-political language and how it's interpreted in every region in which you operate. I said, we have been fighting to raise the image that the Christians are crusaders and haters. So help us <laughs> be a part of that positive change. And according to Times Magazine, I think it was 2008 or 2011, I, I forgot, but recently, in the, in the last few years, the Times Magazine published an article in which they claimed that, and most likely true, that almost 850,000 Christians left Iraq because of the war in Iraq. Now, I do claim some responsibility for the crazy nuts amongst the Muslims. I do. I know there are Muslims who use Islam 
to advocate hate of the Christians in the Middle East. I know that. I have to claim responsibility. I have to be courageous enough to say, yes, it's done in my name. But I also dare to claim that the instability created in the region by the American government with the war that we have created in Iraq had made it possible, had undermined the Christians of the Middle East, and had made so many possible movements and so much work of so many institutions impossible. And therefore, the American government has to claim responsibility, and we, the American people, have to, to, to say to our government, enough is enough. And therefore, one of the things I am suggesting is an active American government role in the protection of the Christians of the Middle East, but of the Muslims of the Middle East as well, because both are undermined by crazy nuts and terrorists. I am advocating a more positive engagement of the American government in the region. I wish this administration was more proactive. I wish they had more engagement. I wish they had taken the decision to engage more with the issue of Syria. I was at the State Department days after, days after the, the riots broke up in Syria, when it was nonviolent. I spoke with, with, with people I knew. I said, please, there has to be, I'm not saying a military engagement, but there has to be an engagement. It has to be an interactive engagement, a proactive engagement, an engagement that engages the entire Middle East, the entire Arab region, the entire Muslim areas, Turkey and other countries. America has to be in the present. You cannot withdraw hoping that something good will happen. And I knew that the Christians, my sisters and brothers, will be the target of Taliban that would come in the, into Syria. And I thought, believe me, it's like, my God, I was prophesizing. I'm not a prophet. I don't claim to be. But if you read history, you know how things happen. I thought more groups like Taliban will be created in Syria, and we'll see more bloodshed, and I said we'll see more kidnapping of Christian leadership, and God knows where things could go. So my sisters and my brothers, my friends, um, I, need, I need to conclude, sorry. I, I, I took the microphone, I'm sorry, but I, I'll conclude. Something I did with uh, the help of RATIB and, and the foundation and other organizations a few years ago, I thought we American Muslims have to claim responsibility and to be in the forefront leading the effort for the protection of the, Muslim, of the Christians of the Middle East. I organized a delegation of American imams and we traveled uh, to Jordan and to Palestine we traveled through Bethlehem and, and Jerusalem in Bejala, Berzeit, uh, Amman. And our motto of the trip of the delegation was American Imams for the Christians of the Middle East. And everywhere I spoke and the delegation members spoke, we said that number one, the birthplace of Jesus cannot be empty from the followers of Jesus. Number two, we are not looking forward to having a Muslim Middle East, but rather a Middle East in which the followers of all religions can be free to practice anywhere, everywhere, including the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I know that's too much to say. And I know this could be on YouTube. But I am willing to be put on the cross. After all, there is a symbol there of someone who's willing to put himself in dangerous areas for the truth and justice, very much as Jesus, according to Christianity, taught us. Then I said in a church in Birzeit, I said, 
we Muslims can never be true to our Islam if the Christians of the Middle East are undermined, overlooked, pushed out, or feel second-class citizens. And then for I said, and I think on Fox News, I think it carried it, and the local uh, Jordanian TV and a Lebanese TV, I said, as an imam, as a clergy, as uh, an expert in Islamic jurisprudence, what I am advocating is in the political realities of the future of the Middle East, a, a civil society uh, that considers all the citizens of any given state equal citizens, regardless of the religion of that citizen. And therefore, no second-class citizens, no the Arabic word ra'aya, I don't know exactly how it would answer the word ra'aya, uh, sort of in, in unnatural inhabitants of the land, so they are, you are in because we support you. The Christians of the Middle East have been there from before Islam, they need to continue to be there with Islam. And as a Muslim, I am, that's my religious mandate. That's my Muslim mandate. For me, that's my understanding of the Quran and Muhammad and his mandate to us. The Prophet of Islam said, Al Anbiya o Kulluhum Ikhwa, that all the prophets who speak for God are brothers. And when he spoke of his relationship to Jesus and Moses, he said, I am nothing but a block, a stone, a block in a wall of blocks. We strengthen one another. And if you take the block out, any block out, the wall is compromised. So the prophet saw himself encouraged by, and so Christians and Jews encouraged by him. So we encourage each other, we support each other, we stand by, by, by each other. To conclude, I hope, I think we need more education on what's going on with the Christians of the Middle East. A lot of education on American TV screens and social media and colleges. Believe me, there is almost no education. I mean, I mean the foundation is doing great. Don't, I'm not undermining, but my God, this is a continent. We need more work. We need to involve every church, every denomination in the United States of America. We need to involve social media and TV on educating them on the historicity of a Christianity in the Middle East, on Christian institutions in the Middle East, and why that is important. Number two, we need to empower the institutions that work on those issues, whether in America or in the Middle East. Number three, we need to encourage tourism. Iria was sitting with the Minister of Tourism of Palestine. She wrote me a note. She said, we need more of those programs that encourage American Muslims and Christians to go to the Middle East to see where Christianity is and where it's, 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 it's hidden. Number four, we need to lobby our American government here to take a different approach, a real approach, a good approach, and the real good approach Give Palestinians a state. They need a state. They deserve a state. And it's about time. Thank you. I can't add a single thing to that. Um, I wonder if you have some questions for any of our panelists um, or all of our panelists. Yeah, Americans uh, generally don't have a good view of Palestinians or Arabs. I mean, that's just the bottom line. So you have that factor. You have the factor that our, our churches remarkably have done on the top level, you know, issued wonderful statements and supportive statements. It doesn't filter down. I mean, you'll rarely hear, Bishop, I'm sure you know this, you rarely hear a pastor talking about you know, the seizure of Palestinian lands, uh, just it goes on and on. None of our people really, I mean, Americans don't know this. I'd suggest that maybe this forum really very seriously 
I mean, we have the bishop here who is connected with the, uh, with the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops, which has a fantastic international committee. That work is never, almost never, heard of in the, uh, in the individual churches. The Methodists, the Presbyterians have very positive movements and statements about the Palestinian issue. I'd suggest that we really, as a goal, as a, as a marker, as a marker for whether we can really tell our, our, our parishioners the truth about what's happening in the Middle East, how the Arab people have been just squelched. Can we share that? And number two, challenge those people to go to their congressmen and express that. All 500 and, uh, uh, congressmen and, and senators. So that's a project that is doable. Do we have the will to do it in America and to share the, the grief that is in the Middle East with Americans and them to feed back to our representatives which have the worst view of the Middle East that they anyone could possibly have and educate them to what's happening. So just comments on that. Uh, something I said uh, when we were meeting yesterday that might uh, at least show uh, one way I think that we can affect what you just said. Um, Beginning back in the 90s, uh, as a bishop of a different diocese that I'm in now, we started taking our seminarians to the Holy Land for a couple of weeks and touring, and uh, both in Jerusalem and in Palestine, and using Palestinian guides and staying in Palestinian hotels, I think that they had their eyes open. Now more than 100 priests have gone through that process, and uh, I think that's the way that you, you get to the grassroots by having the local pastors experience uh, the situation on the ground. Uh, I agree with you that all the various churches have wonderful statements, but if it doesn't become a part of a person's DNA, they're, they're not going to share it. So I think more and more of that that happens, I think will be more and more effective in touching uh, people at the grassroots. Having said that, I want you to know that whenever I feel lonely, I write something on immigration or uh, assisting people and uh, I get enough letters every time I do that I don't feel lonely anymore. <laughs> so I, th I think uh, we're also dealing with a, an attitude in a culture uh, which is not sensitive to the person in need. Maybe, maybe that's why the Holy Father wanted this to be a year of mercy. I, um, one of my favorite biblical passages, I, I feel shy saying this in the presence of... Uh, and the Archbishop, one of my favorite passages that made a difference in my life is Matthew 25, 31 to 46. And if we were in light of Matthew 25, 31 to 46, reshape the discourse, the political discourse, the social discourse, the religious discourse, imagine how much justice there will be there for the Christians, but also for peace and justice in the Middle East. More questions? Or thoughts about what you heard? Um, I'm, my name is Sally McLean and I teach at Montgomery College and I went with a Catholic group um, to the Middle East maybe, I guess three years ago. And then I had a seminar at my house and the first question with, with professors from the college and they said, well, tell us about the wall. And I said, the wall? They said, well, you, you did see the wall. And I said, no, we didn't see the wall. So I went with the Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation, this group. I cannot tell you the difference and I, and I was glad that you said the seminarians went and stayed in Palestinian homes and went to the West Bank. And, we went to Nablus and we met the wonderful priest there who, and I don't know if you've seen his mosaic outside where he said, oh, I will, I will be murdered here very soon. And so I've, uh, I'm an artist and I made my monument in front of the church in Nablus. And uh, so I just want to say the Living Stones, this group, if you ever have not been to the Middle East, 
this is the group to go with, is the Holy Land Christian Medical Foundation. Thank you. Thanks. I wondered if you really have hope or if there's really any point in lobbying Congress. They seem just so resistant. Well, uh, l let me say that um, lobbying a member of Congress with which, from if you are one of the constituents, it makes a difference. If everybody in this room went down to Capitol Hill this afternoon to lobby a congressman and none of us were from his district, we would be ignored. The key thing is for people to make sure that their member of Congress or their senator, if they're lucky enough to have two of them, um, knows about their concerns. And that does make a difference. Um, you know, speaking as somebody from the District of Columbia who doesn't have any representatives in Congress, I feel very envious because I can write all the letters I want on the Middle East that will be put on the desks of congressmen. It will not affect them. They're, they're not interested in the intellectual dialogue. They're interested in the constituent concerns. I want to say something to that. that um, I believe, according to my tradition, that silence is a sin and a crime. And therefore, God does not hold us accountable for accomplishing something, but God does hold us accountable for trying to make a difference. Will it make a difference? Let's have faith and say it will make a difference. Mm. Let's rally in the right way, organize in the right way, institutionalize in the right way, and say it will make a difference. But my, at the end of the day, even if it does not make a difference, I will meet God saying, I tried, I tried my best, and something did not work. So let's try, let's hope, and say it will make a difference. But not be silent. Amen. Thank you. Thanks to all our panelists. I think our time is up and